So there, uh, just a quick run through of what we want to address today. And we've got a bunch of examples that we want to demonstrate. Um, there's some granular stuff we can get into, but from a high level, we have some uh, privacy policy and user term updates that you see you know, from most software companies around this time of year. Um, there are some interface and branding updates, and that's where uh, Morgan and Carrie's expertise uh, comes in. And, and uh, it's, it's nice to have them here to just add a little commentary of what's been updated recently, sort of what's in the works, and also just general thoughts about uh, kind of branding and, and UX best practices. Uh, we also have uh, some workflow updates for calendars. So we can pull up an example of this. I'm, I think this is pretty cool. This is my favorite file that you can attach to a workflow with an app sheet. I guess that's very specific. <laughs> I, I get really excited about calendar invites. Um, and then we got a, a, a Kanban board example app, um, just because this came up in the community recently. And lastly, another topic that came up in the community recently was just a little bit around context and how we could think about taking advantage of that, because it's a kind of flies under the radar, but can be pretty useful. So um, does that sound good with everyone here? Is there anything else you guys? Uh, no, that's great. All right, cool. Let's Let's dig in. So the, the privacy and policy user terms, um, this we can just stay on this page for, but uh, I think most people who have joined, you probably have seen some emails go out from us. The main idea here is that they're very standard to sort of updates that happen every year, and this year is no different. You've probably been bombarded by other uh, you know, privacy policy updates from software companies. And so um, the way that AppSheet handles these is just a slightly unique though, because we are a software company providing you, the app creator, a platform. You, as the app creator, you're also providing platforms for your app users. So we have uh, multiple levels. There's there's a privacy policy inception going on, and um, and so if you're so if any of that is confusing, uh, feel free to you know post in the community. We can help clarify things there for you, or feel free to email us directly um, by responding to some of these announcements going out. Um, there's a big emphasis. Uh, just the beginning of the year, but also just you know right now on uh, making sure that the AppSheet platform and every application um, that you are building is, is as secure and compliant as possible. And so that's why you're seeing these updates going out. One thing that is a little bit unique to AppSheet is that we are uh, adding a app user uh, consent page that will automatically appear to any application that they have access to. And so that's something that you'll see. And this is just a, a little preview of, of what that might look like. If someone's opening their app in the browser, um, and so depending on uh, what permission levels uh, uh, your application require, your your app users will uh, have to opt into this, and that has implications uh, down the road for the type of information that may be available in, say, for example, your audit logs. Um, and so there'll be some more updates that we'll send out regarding that, and, and more details we can provide. Um, we can save the. Uh, community interface updates for the end. I think that's less important, but I think it is a good reminder. We'll just switch over here and, and keep an eye. We've got some more confirmation. Um, and then uh, uh, Public Works, we got a question here, uh, probably on the, uh, actually, I'm not sure what that's referring to yet. But um, just a reminder for those of you that are still logging in right now, um, if you go to this thread, again, you can find it in the community.appsheet.com under education and office hours, and it'll be the top post there, and so feel free to add your questions there. So the the, the top uh, topic, uh, first topic, <laughs> uh, is is this new card view. And and if you've been in, if you've been active in the community, or if you've been using AppSheet recently, you probably have come across this already. But we haven't really addressed it in an office hours yet, um, and so. Um, I have an example here of an application we can pull up in the background, but uh, maybe as a place to get started, uh, Morgan and Carrie, would you like to just kind of introduce, you know, what what the what a card view is and why it's useful in an application? Sure. So the card view is just a way to um, look at a row of data. Um, you can it will show a list of all of your your rows that you kind of hook up for that data. Similar like similar to a deck view or any other uh, or a table view, anything like that except there's different layouts that you can use. And so our goal in making this is to provide a bunch of different layouts and make it flexible so that um, 
you can show your data in a bunch of different ways. So here, Peter's kind of uh, navigating through some different examples of the card view. Um, some of them have, you know, like header images and little um, uh, uh, small images to the left. Some of them with, you know, action buttons down at the bottom. Some of them look more like a list like this, and you can click on any of them to kind of jump into the detail views. Um, so the 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 cool thing about the card view is that really under the hood what's going on is we've made it a lot more flexible for us to generate different layouts. So to get things started, there's four different layouts that you can pick from that uh, Peter has navigated through. But uh, kind of stay tuned because our plan is to add uh, a bunch of uh, additional layouts that could help you in different scenarios as well. So these are kind of just um, the, the basic ones to get started, I would say. Cool. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, and, and so for in this particular application, like Morgan mentioned, we um, there are uh, there are four main types of card views uh, now that you can choose from, and that's what this sample app I think has been designed around. So I just want to uh, run through the editor and just kind of show a few ways you can customize these. Um, yeah, and I would add to that as you are watching this, um, if you if there are certain ways you'd like to lay out your a, a row of your information that isn't supported by the card view post that in the community because we're very open to feedback at this point and and i'd love to support more different uh, more layouts that would work for you guys great i'm going to uh, pause for just 15 seconds while we plug in a better mic um and and if uh, uh, let me just switch over real quick um, give us just 15 seconds and hopefully the audio will be a little bit better here if we if we do this. Okay, we'll uh, we'll keep working on the audio, but right now let's uh, let's jump into the editor view of the Parks app. <clears throat> and I guess just to give a little bit of background here, this is a very simple table. The data is just basically taken from Wikipedia. I think if you Google National Parks Wikipedia, this is what this will be the first thing that shows up for you. And so um, you have some really basic information. You've got a title, you've got a type, you've got an image. Uh, some location, and so that's where we're starting with the um, this map view. Oops, and I closed it. And so from there, then I made four more views, and I made them all card views. Um, let's see here. I'm going to switch over. Okay, I'm curious if that made any difference in audio quality. So as, as we continue here, um, if anyone thinks that that was worth the effort, uh, let us know in the community. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> so in this case, we've got the four card views. And um, you can see kind of along the bottom of the application here, the different types. And so when you, when you go in and you create a new view, I've made this off the parks table, I've selected card view. And then when you drill down, you can select different types of cards. And you can see how these align with uh, the different views that I've added in this application. Um, and so the main thing here that's a little bit unique with how views are defined in, in AppSheet is just a much more intuitive approach to applying like a field value uh, into this, what you could call like a template. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got like a layout here and what you want to do with this layout is say, hey, I want my certain column to show up in that space in my app. And so what Peter's doing is just clicking on an item in that layout and, and then and then selecting on that drop down on the right which column he wants to show in that place. Yeah, this is this is super handy and it's just a lot easier for 
knowing what to expect like uh, in the end view. And so then you'll have that previewed over here and that's what you're seeing right now is how the name of the park and then the state that it's in, uh, that's, that's sort of what has been set up for this particular view. Um, if you go through, so that is the, the list view, the photo view, <clears throat> um, provides kind of a bigger photo, but then has that title. Um, and let's see, backdrop. I think this one's my favorite. You can see how it all just kind of aligns with uh, what that end, you, um, end preview is going to be. And then you also have the ability to um, just define like what happens when you click on these cards. Um, and this is really handy because sometimes the card by themselves, especially if it's a large card, like maybe that's enough detail and there's not that much uh, demand for clicking further into the details. Um, but if you have something really simple like this backdrop view, maybe it, it makes more sense to be able to drill in and see the details of the, whatever that card is representing. Um, great, yeah, and, and um, so something we'll revisit too with the Kanban view, and we might try to make uh, adapt that into the card view, is being able to apply those actions, especially in this large card view. This is super handy for just like real quick uh, updates to whatever that card represents. Um, so this right now, Morgan, is this rolled out to everybody? What is so I just updated it. So today, um, or ideally today, when, when, whenever we deploy next, and we usually deploy every day, um, it should be available to everyone. Um, we've been, I've been kind of cautiously uh, rolling it out to different people who have opted in, chosen to opt in in the community. Um, uh, but today should be the day where everyone sees it. Um, so yeah, feel free to send send us feedback um, once you try it out because this is uh, this is a new thing and we want to I want to iron out all the kinks in it for sure. And this is this is designed to sort of upgrade the existing card view, right? So if you have a card view already, how how will that behave? Yeah. So if you have an existing card view, your apps will just work as they are. Nothing will change. But then if you start tinkering around in the editor and you change your card view using that uh, uh, that layout, those layout templates that Peter just showed you, then your card view will update to this new uh, version. So yeah, if you don't, if you want to leave things the way they are, just don't touch it and it'll stay the way it is. It'll cool. just work as normal. Okay, great. Yeah, and, and one thing that I also really like, and this is new, this is a new update from Morgan and Carrie, is in this preview, especially with the card views now, um, it's nice to be able to preview your application in, in just kind of like a larger form of device. Um, and it, that just gives you a better sense for how these cards are going to be dynamic to whatever device your users are using. Um, I guess just to highlight that a little bit more, um, this, this also, and this is an update from you guys in the past couple months, um, but uh, this I use a lot, which I'll open up my application in a new tab. And that's what I've done over here in order to just view the whole application. Um, a lot of the apps I'm making, I'd say it's 50-50. I'm making mobile apps or uh, web apps, desktop applications. And so this is, uh, that preview is a really quick way to get to your web app version of whatever you're building. Yeah, it's been handy for us because we often will prototype some improvement to the UI and we need to see it in different form factors. So we're like, okay, we need to, we need a better preview system than, than what we've had. That's uh, uh, yeah, a lot of what we're building is kind of useful for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, great. Is there anything, so I guess to extend on uh, some of the interface stuff, there's also some branding updates in the works and I wanted to just switch over to the uh, brand view here because this is the the themes and some of the color schemes. Is, I know that's a topic right now that's that's being considered and updated. Um, yeah. So um, the the what you see here is uh, just an improved experience in the editor for choosing a theme where you can switch between light and dark themes, and then you can choose the primary color that's going to show up for your action buttons and other uh, items in your view. Um, now, Carrie also posted on the community uh, some mock-ups of what we're implementing next. 
And that's really focused on uh, emphasizing the brand more. Um, a lot of people in the community were like, we, it's really important for us to uh, communicate what our brand is. And we heard you guys. Um, so this is w one thing we're doing in the short term, along with some other stuff that we're going to do uh, further down the road. But what we want to do is uh, two things, allow you to uh, have an app logo up in the header. Um, this is something we've had in the past, but it looked pretty clunky. So um, Carrie uh, uh, whipped up a really nice uh, 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 version of that here that we think is still like pretty usable and intuitive, uh, but it also looks great. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is um, add some highlight to the selected item down in the uh, footer navigation. Um, this one communicates branding, but two, we think it's also more usable. A lot of people have um, had difficulty seeing which item is selected in the footer navigation. Um, I know a lot of you guys are out there like, you know, on a construction site, for example, out in the sun. And so if something is selected, it just, you know, changes from gray to black, it's hard to tell. So this should kind of add some uh, usability to your apps as well. Yeah, and then uh, just quick note. So for the logo and the header, that's optional. So if you don't want that, if you don't want your logo in the header, it's still gonna be in the side uh, menu. And then um, another update is, um, so all the colors are the same, except um, I updated some of the contrast. So then it's just gonna be a lot more visible for people who can't see color quite as well. So yeah, it just improves some of the accessibility of it too, whenever this gets implemented. Yeah, and, and what, we talk about this in some of our community posts, but one of the big challenges that we face is making sure that the apps that you guys create are are accessible and usable, um, and but then they also are expressive enough to support what you want. And uh, and so there's a lot of different kind of design considerations that go into these things, and we're always open to feedback. So uh, browse around in the community, look for posts that Carrie and I create, and you'll see us kind of we're we're pretty open about how we're making these decisions. Um, and we're happy to, to incorporate what you guys think. Great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to these. And I guess maybe to confirm, some of this that we're previewing right here, this is in the works right now. It's not not available to anyone, but... Now we have it. Yeah, I would say within the next two-ish two, two -ish weeks uh, to expect to see this. Cool. That's great. I'm, I'm excited to have that uh, app icon potentially in my app. Because especially when I'm switching between many, For yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> losing yeah. track of which one I'm in. <clears throat> All right, let's jump back to the agenda and see where we are here. So there's some card view updates. These are um, real easy to get in and start exploring and, and playing with and, and adding into your applications. The updated branding options. This is an ongoing effort, and there's some cool things in the works right now that you'll probably see updated in the next few weeks. Um, and, and just kind of an ongoing basis. Um, there are, uh, so, we, so we've got, just to switch gears a little bit, um, there's some uh, calendar invitation workflow options that have been added recently. Um, this, is, this is pretty cool, and I, uh, I have a sample app that, um, just to switch over back to the community post, and I see we've got a bunch of good questions here too, so I don't know if, uh, if it's worth uh, uh, trying to look at any of those before we jump into this workflow app, but something for this card view, if you want to see the editor view that, you, that we were just working on, uh, the editor view for this card view, uh, the editor view for this uh, workflow, uh, calendar invite workflow app is available here, and then uh, what we'll get to next is Kanban board. Um, you can click here to access any of those, so if you want to follow along, uh, we can switch over to um, this meeting invite and, and show you an example of what's going on here. Um, uh, questions? Are we uh, good for the moment? Or uh, I guess we could take a, a break, right, between these and answer a couple of these questions. Um, so I think there's one uh, from is it Evolt? I'm not sure. Yeah. OCR. Well, not OCR. I think yeah. we were. It was a pretty big initiative for us last month, um, and. You know, do you have any updates on your end from that, Peter, or anything? Well, so, I mean, there's a lot of activity. We see a lot of people using the OCR functionality, and, and this is embedded. So I'll open up the editor. We don't have an example pulled up right now, but I guess just to, to get to this question, if you go into Intelligence and you go to the OCR tab, 
Um, this is one place to get started with uh, OCR models, and, and this is a great way. If you have, for example, um, uh, uh, employee badges, and so you have a standard uh, sort of format of employee badges that you have, you could take pictures of, and then if you just fill in a table that, that aligns the information on those badges with the photographs you've taken of them, you can train a model, and then every new picture you take, it will extract to those fields. So we don't have an example for you right now, but there's uh, that's the root of a lot of the OCR functionality. And so you can uh, get started with that intelligence and OCR models. Um, there are also some cool just expressions that you can apply everywhere. Say, for example, extract text. And so that will, if you've taken a photo, you can have a like a virtual column that just extracts the text from whatever that image is. So there's some cool stuff there. We'll, we'll add some links in this thread to some of the other resources for that. Um, and uh, yeah, some some like our landing page and also just a previous office hours that includes more info on that. Sweet, sweet. Uh, and then we have another question from Jonathan. Um, and welcome, Jonathan. Ho hopefully uh, you get a chance to join us uh, more often here. Uh, but question from Jonathan, uh, he asks, are there any future updates coming for the web view? Uh, the buttons are so small on the bottom of this uh, large screen. Uh, would be nice if the setup was different on the web. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add there, Gary, or any Man, thoughts. Uh, bottom navigation on desktop view. I, I'm definitely working on a prototype, and we're going to test out like different layout options. Um, so yeah, uh, stay tuned. That's yeah, what I, got. I would add to that. You know, stay tuned in the next few weeks. Kate, uh, Carrie has made mock-ups of some really cool alternate view layouts for the web view in particular. And we want desperately, like we want to add more customization for you guys who are making web views. Um, oh, but right now we're, it's still like sort of in the works of what exactly what we want to put out there for you all. But okay. keep an eye on the community. We'll, we'll make a post about yeah, something. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Thanks. And uh, there's another one from Public Works. Uh, you asked, what's the advantage for this feature? Um, could you uh, clarify a little more what feature you're referring to? Uh, and then we'll, we'll revisit your question. Yeah, that, and that, I, that might have come during the privacy, the user consent page. And, and part of that is just sort of some necessary, I don't know if that's what he was referring to or not, but mm -hmm. um, um, uh, there are some custom customizations there that you can apply that uh, we'll make sure to follow up with some links on. So I guess uh, just to move over for the um, uh, yeah privacy yeah we'll follow up with some more information for you um, public works I assume that's not your name <laughs> um, let's let's jump into this uh, ICS calendar invite and so if it sounds a little obscure ICS is just the file type that uh, whenever you get an email that has a Google Calendar sort of like a calendar header it, for example in Gmail. Um, uh, but uh, you'll, you'll get this little header and it allows you to accept an invitation and add it to your Google Calendar. Um, what has happened is an ICS file has been attached to that email. ICS is universal though, it's not just Google. And so if, uh, if you're working in Outlook, uh, it'll work very similarly, uh, but allows you to really quickly just add items to your, to your calendar and it's a meeting invitation. And so the way that that has been added and the way that it's useful is if you have set up a workflow, um, in this case, we have a meeting invite workflow, and I'll show you what this application does in a second. But um, if the workflow sends an email to participants, then if you scroll down a little bit further, uh, you can see that an attachment is being added to this email. And it's that attachment content type most of the time people like to attach PDFs. I think that's the most common where, where people will generate a PDF report and then send it in an email as like a notification or a, a you know, report or analysis or whatever it is. Um, but if you add an ICS file, that's, that's the meeting invite. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at this template in a second, um, but let me just show you, this is a pretty simple application. And so the premise here is we have a calendar and then uh, we've got uh, details. So this is kind of an interactive uh, meeting uh, a scheduler. And Fong and I had a meeting back on the third, apparently. 
I don't even know if that was during the week or not. It was a Friday. Okay. <laughs> um, so if I set, if I schedule a new meeting here, and let's say I want to meet with Morgan. Um, Morgan doesn't have a cool hat like I do. When I save this, <clears throat> um, then that's going to sync, and the workflow is going to fire. And so in the background here, uh, we're going to we're going to each get an email. And uh, this ICS file has been attached to that email. And so let's look at uh, just kind of the innards of what, what this file is. Uh, after, um, let me pull up, um, I don't have it ready, a preview of the email. That's okay, we'll, we'll add a preview of the email to the thread. Um, but uh, this has arrived in Gmail and what, the, uh, what file is attached if you hit view, you'll get this little no preview available because um, the ICS file type um, template has been made in this case in Google Drive because that's where my data is located. Now Google Drive doesn't have like a native uh, file editor for ICS files. What I've done, uh, now you can very easily, the default option would be to download this ICS file and open it in a text editor and that's what you'll see here in a second. But also in Google, you can connect applications, just like you've connected AppSheet. And so I looked for a text editor, and that's what I added here. So I'm just opening this ICS file in a, a G Suite Marketplace text editor, and that's what we're seeing over here. And so I've zoomed in a little bit. This is a, a free version, so it's got some ads on the side. But this is the file that AppSheet is generating and attaching to that email. And it looks a little intimidating at first uh, if you're not familiar with these. But what you'll notice is that it's following the same format as any other sort of uh, email attachment uh, template. And so you can insert in the summary, we've got a meeting title, we've got a start and an end date. And so that's where the start uh, date and time and the meeting end date and time is being included. And then uh, the organizer here in this case um, is just the username and it's mailing to the user email. Um, I've, I've added a description to here, one-on-one -on -one meeting with and then participants. So in this case, participants, if we go back in my application, I realized once I was editing this calendar invite that I just want kind of a, a, a consolidated uh, text field that includes all the participants. So I had to go back into my data and I think that'll be in meetings if I scroll to the bottom, you can see I made a virtual column. So I added a virtual column. And then the formula for this virtual column is um, just a tangent, just a little bit. It's an expression saying here, um, it's a dereference expression. And it's saying, okay, participant number one, which is going to have an email value, go grab their first name from the people table and then put and, and then uh, participant number two, go grab their first name from the people table. And so you end up with uh, just a nice clean line that says uh, Peter and Morgan, and those are the participants, and that's what's gonna be added to the, to the details. Um, if anyone has questions on that, we can, we can definitely elaborate, uh, but that's, that's sort of just a handy way of making some clean fields, um, so then you don't have things like you know, Peter at AppSheet.com and Morgan at AppSheet.com are meeting on this date. Um, so that is uh, the summary here. Let me um, uh, also just highlight, so on, on the right side here, this is an example of what those end users are gonna be receiving and, uh, and will be accepting. So for every existing application you have and every future application you have, the first time your app user logs into the app, including in the emulator here, just as an example, so, so you can see it happening. Um, they'll, like, they'll have to accept these terms. Um, now, these terms, and, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but let's, let's look at uh, um, where these can actually be edited. They can accept these, and these are just sort of the standard AppSheet platform uh, terms and privacy policy. If you go into info for each application and properties, um, and information for app users. You also have a way of uh, adding on some information for the privacy policy and also for the terms of use. And so 
Um, probably not relevant for, for most folks to do that, but if, um, if there are important th details that you need to add to let your users know, you can do that here in Info and Properties, and that will be added to this page. Okay, so we're jumping around a little bit. Um, in this case, uh, this, this is just a, an example of how um, uh, meetings can be sent and, and added to people like, the, you know, send the invites can be sent around and you can easily accept and add stuff to your calendar. Um, is there anything else regarding the ICS file type you guys want to chime in on or should we keep moving along? Yeah, so once uh, somebody sent a meeting, um, would you have to accept it on your end as well or does it automatically go to your calendar? Uh, so that's a good question. I think that depends on sort of how you're receiving it. Because in Gmail, I think you have the ability to set it to automatically accept any calendar invite. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm not. I'm less familiar with Outlook these days. Um, even less familiar with Lotus Notes. I don't know if you guys have used that in a while. But um, I th I'm, I'm sure. I think it's based on your inbox. You have some settings to automatically accept. I don't know. Can anyone else in the community confirm? Uh, if you've been using ICS yet and, and how you accept those invites. Um, I want to real quickly just open up a preview. So I'm going to switch gears. Sorry, I'm going to, yeah. So I've switched over to my inbox <clears throat> and just kind of zoomed in on that preview that then you get. And so in this case, that workflow that I just set when I invited Morgan to a meeting. This is what was emailed to me. And so you can see uh, those two recipients for me and Morgan. And then it this uh, the only way that Gmail adds this little header bar is if there's an ICS file attached. And so that's what's being done here. And you can see the time uh, was added correctly. And that gives you the ability to just quickly add that to your calendar. There's the ICS file. OK, great. Should we keep moving along? Yeah. Let me, um, I want to quickly scan the thread. Yeah, so uh, Daisy has a question regarding the privacy policy that you just highlighted. Um, so her question is for TOS and privacy policy page, can we update the data we're capturing? And is it just a one-time acceptance that's required? And then uh, follow-up question with that is, uh, where does it store the acceptance record? Um, how does it work for a public app? These are, these are great questions. And I think a lot of this is still sort of rolling out in uh, just how, how control over this is, is going to be um, available for the app creator. And so some of these are just for, you know, app sheet, um, uh, for the AppSheet platform as a whole, and then some of this is uh, really specific to the creators. So Daisy, we'll definitely, we don't have everything available for you right now to, to get into that, but we'll definitely follow up with like a full uh, explanation of, of what's available to control and how. Cool. All right, let's jump over to, this is uh, again, switching gears a little bit, but uh, the, the topic of a Kanban board came up Recently, I think it was sparked by some of the card view updates and people were thinking about, okay, different ways of taking advantage of the cards. Um, and so I made an example and then we were talking about it a little bit more and um, I want to take a look at it. I think it's a good example of how to take advantage of slices, of how to think about dashboards and also think about how you might be able to use some of these cards to just better, um, you know, kind of manage projects. I think that's the most common use case for this. So let's switch over here and I just want to, this is a real, uh, again, a real simple application. There are two tables with only a few rows of data. That's what this application is based off of, and we'll take a look at it. But the, the idea here is if you have, let's say, three different stages, and you've got a handful of projects, or you've got hundreds of projects, uh, what's a real easy way to give your users the ability to move those projects around through different stages? And so, before we jump into the app, uh, can you give a definition of what exactly is a Kanban or a little oh. overview of, of what it is for people who, who don't exactly know? I, I don't know if I'm the best person to do this. I can barely pronounce it correctly. I don't know where the, na the name originates, but uh, if you've ever used Trello before, basically it's a project management 
whiteboard. It's you can think of it like if you had sticky notes up on a whiteboard, right? And you had a bunch of different projects, and you want to move any of those sticky notes to different columns on your board, right? Um, that's basically what a Kanban board is. But we've created a digital version of that here. <laughs> I heard a story um, over the holidays because <clears throat> I was in Minneapolis, which is where 3M is located, that the scientist, I'll call him a scientist, I'm not sure if he was, <laughs> at 3M who invented post-it notes, apparently uh, made the post-it notes and like gave it out to the team and like just gave away his post-it notes internally and kept and got everyone really hooked on them. And then, and then he took them away. And everyone's like, where are my post-it notes? Oh. You know, I don't know what they called them at that point. <laughs> and it was at that point they realized, oh, wait, we rely, we rely on these so much. We should probably start selling them. And that's uh, apparently like that's how cool. they, that's, that's at least a story I've heard. So we'll see. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, so this is, I think, um, if, uh, if you're trying to digitize your post-it notes, <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> how to start thinking about it. I think the, um, you know, so we've got these stages to do and in progress and done. Uh, you could get a lot more elaborate than that. And what is what's happening behind the scenes here is that we've got slices dividing up um, these different projects, and we've got different views built on those slices, and then we have actions that change the data of the project to a different stage. And so when you click that action, say for organizing the office, this action when I click it is going to change the status of this project to in progress. And so then the effect is, it just moves it right over into the next column. This is super slick. I really like this. I like, and, and so as I, you know, work with something like this, and I think about how maybe a card view will make it a little bit more visual and give me a little bit more information, and can move them back and forth. I think that's sort of the next uh, version of this that I'll work on. Um, but let's look behind the scenes. You can just kind of see how you can move these back and forth by clicking the actions. And so uh, let's take a quick look at just how this was set up. That's pretty straightforward. I want to start with the tables, um, just to really emphasize how simple this is. We have a table of projects with just names, images, descriptions, a status. That's really all you need, but there's a few other things here regarding dates. And then we've got people. And so in this case, we've got um, uh, some of the product marketing team here uh, with our Lego headshots. And that's it. That's all of this application. And so when I look in the data, I can see those that's been connected. And a key part of this is the projects have uh, statuses. That's an enum value. And so it's going to be to do, in progress, or done. In order to change <clears throat> the status of these projects, um, we've created actions. And this gets a little bit more, this is probably, this is, of the entire application, this is probably what took the most amount of time. Um, just because I did it manually, if you keep an eye on the header, there, are, there will be suggestions throughout AppSheet. And there is actually a suggestion that if it identifies you have a status column or an enum value, it will suggest, um, I, I think it's called an ordered flow suggestion, which will create very similar actions to this automatically with one click. So I did, the, I did this each individually, but keep an eye out for the suggestions because I know that Joe and Tony uh, if, are, are adding a bunch of new suggestions these days that, that can be really valuable to just expedite um, app creation. In this case, these actions, if we just look to one of them, for example, this move to in progress, the action type is uh, changing the value of some columns in this row set the values and the value we're setting is status to in progress and so as long as you just keep your labels uh, organized here so this action is called move to in progress and what it's going to do is set the status to in progress this will be in progress too but this one I'm going to be using for my done projects I'm only going to display it for the projects I'm moving back to in progress so it moves the items that are in the far right to the middle. Exactly, yeah. And that's so you can see the arrows are pointing different ways. And so this is where you have to start keeping track of, okay, well, if it's if it's going to be done, but I want to move it back to in progress, i got to make sure it's a left pointing arrow. The last, and so you can see how we've made those different actions. 
less slightly tricky part of this is um, when to display it. And so now sometimes you could put a, uh, it may make sense to, to do a show if condition. So only show this behavior if uh, you're in a certain view or there's a certain the value is set to something specific that actually we'll get to in a second regarding the context view that that can be kind of handy for that in this case it's really easy because in the UX section I scroll down here and this is we'll we'll get into how these different views are created off of slices but for each of these deck views you can manually choose which actions show up so this is this in this case this is kind of the easiest way to just control which actions will show up and in which order. Um, so actually look at the in progress. <clears throat> in progress, we can move back to done or over to uh, or back to to do or over to done, left or right. And so you can see there are two different actions: move to to do or move to done. And that's why there are two showing up here. But in either of these, there's only one action showing up. So last last part of this, and feel free to if if people are if I'm losing anyone, feel free to add some questions here about this. We can dive into more detail. But the last key part of this is how you create these different views off of slices. So you can see we've got a done view in progress and to do, and those have been added to this Kanban dashboard. To do and progress done. But the way to do this is to create slices. So we have this project table, um, but then we've created slices of that table. And this is essentially saying, okay, here's a table of any project where the status is to do, where the status is in progress, where the status is done. And these are basically act as their own tables that you can build views from, and that's what we did for each of these views. So you can see when I open up this in progress view, the data that it's based off of is the slice as opposed to just the whole projects table. So that all together um, gives you the effect of being able to change statuses and having each project move between their respective sliced views within a dashboard. Yeah, just to reemphasize that. Um, so once, let's say uh, we have was it office hours been in progress, and if Peter were to click the right arrow, the status of that project will be done, right? So then it wouldn't be included in the in progress slice in, no, anymore, right? It would now be included in the done slice. So now it would kind of disappear from the middle section and move to the right section. So yeah. that's how like the slices work on kind of moving projects through each of these. Right now we have two projects to do and two that are done. And so if we look at our data, it should represent that. So there are the two that are to do and there are the two that are done. And so if we move the organizing the office back into in progress and we force a sync, just to speed it up, you can see how it just changed in progress there. That's a little small, but um, uh, that's, that's all that's happening behind the scenes. Okay, so um, I, I saw a question from Daisy about the onboarding view. That we should definitely get to uh, while we've got you guys, sure. uh, just to, to show a little bit of that. And I, I guess maybe bef uh, let's let's tee that up. One thing, just the, the last thing about the Kanban view here is, and what I want to work into kind of a version two of this application, is incorporating the cards. So right now I'm just using the deck view for this and it works very well. Um, but the next step is, for example, I'll start with to do is if I move it over to the card view, now I could potentially use these different types of cards um, to represent my projects. But I'll have to kind of think about, I still want the effect of moving the cards back and forth with those actions. And so, you know, depending upon which card, I may not have the ability to to, to do have the same effect, but I think the list view and the large view give me those options. So large, for example, I could have all the details of my project embedded into this view, and then I could include those actions and customize them uh, down here in the bottom. 
I think that's that's probably the best view for this. But then I can also use list, which is very similar to deck view. It's kind of a cleaner format. And it's got that menu option here. And within the menu option, then I could have the ability to move, uh, use those actions to move the projects back and forth. So that would I'd say the ne that'd be the next step. And I'm, I'm curious to see if anyone in the community has, has started tinkering with this yet, if they have any similar examples. Um, okay, so having said that, the question about the about page, that's a great reminder. Is that something you guys would be able to? Um, um, I think we can do it if we have an example, a working example. Um, this is a, a, another new feature. So again, let me know if there are kinks that we run into. Um, but I can explain the basic idea of this. Um, what we noticed is that a lot of people were using the about view to explain a lot of information about their application for new users. Um, and it's pretty clunky because you don't have a lot of space in the about view to do this. Um, and it's not connected to your data. All you could do is just kind of uh, use your app logo and provide a, a, a couple uh, sentences to describe what's going on. So uh, uh, I built a, a first class view to handle this. Um, and it works kind of like a, just like a slideshow. Um, uh, and I think, so I don't have an example for you to up right now. This is something yeah. that we'll add to the thread. Yeah, um, we can create an example and put it on the community. And, and um, if you, there's already an announcement in the community that shows it working, um, but um, we can definitely provide some more here as well. Yeah, so what I did right now is I just went to the what's new tab, and this is a tag that's new, and you can see Morgan posted this um, recently, and this is just kind of a preview of, um, let's see if it loads, of how those slides will yeah. appear. And this is yep. based on its own table, an own onboarding table you would have to provide, right? Yep, so each slide is just a row in your table, and then you can kind of wire up what you want the image well you know it, the image and the the information below it are all columns in, yep. in those rows um so yeah really simple idea it it's only for mobile right now um we're, we're gonna include some uh you know uh, widescreen and web versions of it um, so there's going to be improvements to come but this is a basic uh thing to get started with cool thanks <clears throat> The last main thing on the agenda was just a little bit of information about context. I know that that came up in the community and we were also talking about it earlier. I think that's it's a good uh, expression to be aware of. So we can uh, uh, just discuss that for, for just a few minutes before things get wrapped up today. Um, but just wanted to check in. Is there anything else we're, uh, that we should uh, address from the Q and A? Uh, I think we have a few questions there, um, but let's just cover this topic and we have some time remaining we could address couple of those and if not we just follow up cool okay um, so <clears throat> again we're taking kind of another right turn here this is an entirely different topic but it does I think it can be applied really well to this Kanban uh, project management board I use context actually like all the time um, in particular uh, and there are four different uh, kind of methods for using context and the, they have different applications um, so to speak. Uh, so we're just going to run through some examples of this here and then I'll show you how it can be applied to this last app we were looking at. Context is basically a way of, and jump in here if, if you guys have a better way of describing this, but I kind of think of it as um, knowing where the user is or what they're looking at and then using that information then to influence sort of what the application is displaying or what information is available to them. Is that, uh, I feel like that's a good, um, so some examples of this, it becomes kind of evident. Um, if you, for example, use the context post, um, you can tell if the application, if the application user is logged in to the web app version, so they're opening the app in their browser or they're opening it up on their mobile device. This is probably, um, this is within the, this is the top, uh, let's see, it used to be the top context expression I use. It's been replaced by a different one here. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's super handy for, say, for example, 
if I go back to my Kanban application, now let's see, let me delete this view. I have two main views, new projects and then the Kanban board. Now the Kanban board is a dashboard and it's got this handy um, uh, option to be able to view the dashboard in a mobile view. But maybe I've decided that I just don't want this view displayed in mobile at all. Um, it's just not, I, I'd, I'd rather everybody be looking at the main dashboard that this is on, on their, on their computer, and that's where it's most usable. Um, so something I can do is, if I scroll down to the show if condition, I've added a context expression here that's just saying, this is just true, false. If uh, context host equals browser, then we'll show this view. So now when I open up uh, this application on my mobile device, the only option I have is to add a project, uh, which is maybe that's handier for if you're in a meeting and you just need to jot down a project real quick that you're thinking of, you'll get it on the board, but you have to go back to your desktop in order to actually view the whole board. Um, so that's, that's one example. I don't know if you guys have used this for anything else. The other example that um, I tend to use a fair amount is view type. Um, I think I've brought this up before, but something that I really like to do is in, and I, I think the meeting tracker might have this, in forms, when I'm uh, filling out the form, I like to have as few fields as possible. And so you can do this in a few, way, few ways, but let's just look at the meetings. Um, so for example, this meeting has an ID, but the meeting ID is being automatically generated by unique value, unique initial value. So I don't want to show it. That's just taking up space. So I'll, I can I can hide it using this method by turning off show. Um, there may be other stuff, for example, like who created this meeting that I'm capturing in the background, but I don't need to show it here in the form. And then there may be other things here, like my virtual columns that would potentially show up in the form, uh, but it's not relevant right now as I'm setting my meeting. It's only relevant later when I'm sending the meeting invite or when I'm looking at the meeting details on the calendar. And so what I've done is in the show conditions, I've created, uh, I'm, I've used the expression builder. And for example, the participants virtual column that I mentioned earlier, I've added the expression to um, only show that participant's field if you're not in the form. So you can show it everywhere else, uh, including the workflow, um, but just don't show it in the form. And so that's that's all that we have here. And for the, if you're not familiar yet, this is the not equal to uh, carrots or I don't know what, you guys know what this is called? Uh, is that an operator? Like, yeah, okay, thank you. That's that's probably a better way of describing. It. <laughs> anyway, right. So what this is telling me now is uh, uh, um, when I um, am in the view type, which is where I left. So this view type is equal to form, and so the field will not show, and that's why I'm only getting these left uh, visible. So those those are just a couple uh, example. I I tend to use those two a fair amount. View will give you. Um, the, the value of the actual view name, and then context uh, app name will give you the, the name of the actual app. I use those a little less frequently, um, but uh, the, these can be used in all sorts of different ways. I think this is a good one to be aware of, especially as you're thinking about, along with some of these UX best practices, uh, how do you make the experience as useful and relevant for the end user as possible? And sometimes that means uh, just removing some of the noise or some of the unnecessary information. Um, that, that was the main point I wanted to make about that. I don't know if, uh, do you guys have anything else you'd like to add? I feel like I'm talking a lot, and I'm the one with the cold, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm especially nasally today, more so than usual. Yeah, I mean, I think just the high-level point is with context, it gives you a way to say, hey, I want to show something, but I only want to show it in a specific context, which is why it's called context. So if the user is using a specific uh, form factor or they're in a particular view yep. um, or they're in a particular app it gives you a way to kind of control that something i haven't done yet but i've thought about is you can actually um, 
using some of the new actions this is this is going down the rabbit hole a little bit but can be really useful as you're thinking about scaling up uh, some of your applications some of your actions um, can uh, you know add a row to another table so hear me out here um, and you can string actions together to do multiple things and so uh, with this I have the ability of logging user behavior in a separate table so every time somebody creates a new meeting uh, log it in an activity table and when you log it in the activity table you may also provide that context information to be able to say like oh actually you know, 80% of people are setting meetings from the mobile device, um, uh, but they're viewing their calendar, you know, 80% of people are actually viewing the calendar from their desktop device. This is getting in the weeds a little bit, but you can provide that context and you can actually log it and use that information elsewhere to help kind of evolve your application. Um, I might try adding that to a couple of mine soon, so we'll see. Um, we are getting, oh, we, it is 10, 10.01. Are there any, uh, 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 I think we'll we'll look through the questions here and just make sure uh, that we've addressed all of them. We'll also I know that there are already some that we want to follow up with. Just some links to more details. Uh, some of the OCR stuff I think is great. If you're not familiar with that, we'll add links in there um, to other community posts, but also some of the landing pages and webinar content. Um, that is great to get familiar with. Um, and uh, it will, I'll, we'll hang around here for a few minutes just to, to uh, follow up with any pending questions. But uh, for those of you who have to log off, thanks, thanks for joining today. Uh, we will do office hours every two weeks. Um, so uh, you can register for the next one uh, starting later this afternoon. Thank you, Morgan and Carrie, for, for sharing uh, some of the updates with the UX uh, and AppSheet. And like we said, give us feedback. We're always trying to improve these things. Yeah, and that feedback is best routed in the community. Just to keep uh, emphasizing this, uh, we'll be putting a lot of, especially within the announcements, that's where you'll see some of these previews and also when new features are launched. Uh, that's where you can uh, add your thoughts and feedback. Um, so we'll hang out here for a second, but otherwise, thank you for joining. Um, and you should get a recording of this um, that we'll post in the community and it should be emailed to you uh, later on today as well. Um, and we will uh, see you in a couple weeks. Okay, Fong and I are going to just uh, scan the community here for, for some pending questions. Uh, for those of you that are still logged in, anything that, uh, that you're interested in chatting about that uh, we'll, we'll try to provide as much information as we can, or we can dig into any of these sample apps and just poke around a little bit. Um, so let's, we're gonna just take a second to scan some of the questions. So uh, there's one from Tariq. Uh, he asks, does the here expression uh, need user sign-in? Or That's has it stopped in my public app saying it needs user sign-in? Yeah, so this is something that uh, is in, in the works right now. I think there was an update. Um, so as the user app user consent uh, has been rolling out, there are some expressions that have uh, previously relied on um, the user uh, login in order to function. I think here is one of those that requires user consent. And so there's going to be a little bit of a uh, gap here where the app users, we really encourage you to notify your app users that they should look for this consent because um, starting now, it'll probably be necessary for them to approve that consent in order for expressions like here to be functional, right? They are, they're uh, giving consent to you to actually pull their information, store their information for your application. Um, that's the nutshell. And, and so I think if there's anything more specific about your particular app, but I, there were a lot of conversations around the here expression, that happens to be one of the main ones because you know, using app user 
location uh, that's that's sensitive and that's going to require approval. Sweet. Um, and here's another one from Public Works. Uh, they ask, could you show me the source database so I can understand the photos showing up in the layout? I assume that this is referring to the card view. Yeah, let's let's look at that real quick. So this one, uh, uh, I'm pulling up the National Parks app, and if we go into data and tables and we open this up and we view the source, it's just a Google sheet. And basically all I did was copy and paste the table from the Wikipedia article. I think that's okay. Is that okay? I feel it's like okay. that's open to use. Um, and there's a column there that is linking to images that are hosted on Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is a pretty reliable source you don't always want to link to images hosted elsewhere because then you you know you're not sh you may be less certain as to the reliability of it. Um, it oftentimes makes more sense to then host it yourself, and that could be either in your Google Drive uh, folder, or maybe you have a separate cloud storage option where you're hosting your images that your apps are using. In this case, all we're doing is just linking to a Wikipedia image. And that is what is being pulled through and displayed in this application. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then another one from Jonathan. Um, he asks, will the Kanban app be a sample app? I think this is a, a link in the yeah. announcement up here, Jonathan. Uh, you just go here and then you could uh, select the this link. It will send you straight to the sample app with the Kanban. Yeah, and so from this, because it's a sample app, you can view, you can look under the hood, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, what Fong is pointing to now is you can copy that from the link um, along the sidebar. Yeah. Cool. Let's see. There was something. So uh, Jonathan actually had another question about this. I don't, did we get to this? So uh, just a question about um, like tracking who has potentially done these actions. And that's actually kind of what I was alluding to um, with, uh, with, your, uh, with some of these actions. So let's see. Uh, so in the Kanban view, uh, without getting super granular, if we go into the actions here. So these are fairly straightforward actions that are just changing the value of a certain field. Now, you can also have actions that do things like add a row to another table. And, and adding a row to another table is a great way of, say, having a log of what people are doing. And so, um, Let's say uh, you add a row to another table and, uh, okay, actually, I, this is maybe getting a little bit away from your question, Jonathan, but I would keep that in mind as, okay, maybe I wanted to store record. Every time someone clicks on this action, I want to add a row to another table. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. We we use that internally for, for example, our uh, like internal resources and sales resources and use cases. So we can see, oh, these are the types of uh, files that are being used frequently. Um, so think about that. But then I think the your question specifically gets to who has added it to in progress. In this case, um, you could have, for example, a column in your data that just say that is like last edited by. Um, that that may may get to what you're addressing. In this case, we have an owner column, but then we have a less edited by. And if we had a less edited by, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and add. And then we go back into our data, and we're going to want to regenerate the structure, which will add that column. So now we have the last edited by column. I'm going to go ahead and make that a reference to the people table. Oops. 
And then while I'm in here, I'm going to actually uh, set the initial value to be user email. And then I'm going to reset the value of this every time the project has edited, has been edited. So when I hit every time we hit that action in the Kanban board, you're editing that row because you're changing the status. So every time this row is edited, then this last edited column name uh, should also update. And it should update with the initial value of user email which is the value of the person logged in making that change. Mm -hmm. So if we save that, um, we can go ahead and give it a try. I think, I can't think about anything I'm missing here. No, I think you covered it. Let's see if it works right here. So now I, I go back in my application and one thing to keep in mind is that if I look at the version of this app, if I go to the about page and I look down at the bottom, this is version 53, but in my web app over here, I'm on version 50. Okay, so I'm, be, I'm a little bit behind. So I'm gonna go ahead and refresh this. Now when I look at it, okay, now I'm at 53. Um, that's something to keep in mind, just to make sure that if you're testing something and it's not working, make sure it's the same version, the latest version. So now let's say I move my flight plans over to done projects. Now I'll go ahead and force the sync. And now when I go over into my last edited column, you can see that it's added my name. So Fong made this project, but I've been the last one to edit it and the current status is done. So uh, hopefully that uh, points in the right direction. I think that should get you close to what you're asking for, John. See? Okay, uh, just to go down the list here, um, there's a question from Siaren. Uh, they ask, not seeing your layout view, is it available to general users yet? Layout view, as in the, um, the new card views? Yeah, and so, I think this also, uh, Josh, who kind of followed up with that, like, um, he asked about the card view feature being live for oh, yeah. users. Uh, so I think these are connected, and then Jonathan mentioned that, um, you know, it should be released within 24 hours, and yeah. Yeah, so and that, that's, I think, I'm not sure if Morgan mentioned this or not, but it's this is still sort of in the final rollout stages. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, these views, the, the card new card view options are available to many people right now. And then if, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, you should see it this week, I think, at the latest. Awesome. Yeah, I think... Um, on that note, because we're running a little late, uh, I know there are a few more questions there that, that we should get to, but there are also, uh, I think, a bunch of details and links that, that we'll be adding to this thread. So if you guys want to, if we look at the thread, I think we'll end, for those of you that have hung around, I feel like you're probably more likely to be using the community. There have been some updates here. Um, first of all, we'll be adding a lot of details to this Office Hours thread. Um, something that you can do for any of these posts is uh, set alerts on it. And so if you want follow-ups or uh, to be pinged with notifications when new stuff is added here, you can do that this way. Uh, the, the thing that I would end on, though, is just start some of these uh, community updates as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. There's some interface changes, but the main idea here, that there are two main goals for some of the updates we're making in the community. One is there's a ton of really valuable content uh, either questions that have been answered, uh, really popular questions that have been answered more than once that need to be exposed in better ways. So as people are looking for answers to their questions, there's actually a decent chance that the, your question has already been answered and it's available somewhere in the community. We just need a better way of, of sharing it and making it visible. So that's, that's one goal that we're trying to, to do. And the second is to just utilize uh, tags more efficiently. So they're much, they're, uh, new tags have been added, and a lot of those tags and the most popular topics within those tags are, have been made available through this new menu structure. And so if I go to, for example, UX, you can see some of the most popular UX topics 
uh, front and center. And this is a great way of just discovering ideas and seeing um, what some of the other cool projects are that other app creators are working on. Um, so a few things here that um, are, could be pretty handy to take advantage of as you're trying to learn more, um, get better at building apps. Yeah, I uh, highly encourage um, people who are new on to the platform uh, to use the community who want to learn. And also feel free to post your questions, right? There's a lot of people who've been around for, for years building apps. So, um, you know, they will probably be able to answer your question for you. Or, you know, if you have a new use case that none of us came across, like that's like a product feedback um, yeah. for our engineers uh, that we will address. So, um, yeah, we really encourage people to, you know, start new ideas and contribute to the community. Uh, it really helps um, for everyone building apps and us to help you know improve the, the platform as well. There's a uh, kind of a hidden link in here for, for those of you guys that are a little bit more familiar with AppSheet. If you go to education and lend a hand, this will give you a quick uh, kind of a direct route to questions that don't have any answers yet. Um, and so this is just filtered for the new year. So we'll see throughout 2020 how many uh, how many unanswered questions can we keep it down to? And I'm shooting for, for zero on this list <laughs> in 365 days. So if anyone else would like to help, uh, it's always greatly appreciated. This is all app creators are contributing to this. This isn't just app sheet and plays. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, something that then I think really shows is, um, you know, who in the community is getting the most likes on their contributions. And so you can see as you start adding more content and answering questions, but also just sharing ideas, um, you'll see yourself float up on this list. Yeah. And, and the idea here is that we don't want to see a lot of app sheet, uh, I guess. Well, there are far like more, uh, far more and, and far more experienced app creators that are outside of these walls than mm -hmm. there are inside. And so, uh, um, you know, the best ideas are coming from just users all around the world, literally. Uh, so it's just great to, to hear any of those ideas here. Awesome. Um, so I'll stop sucking up to everybody left in office hours, but uh, thanks again for taking the time this morning. There's been a lot of good, uh, a lot of good questions and we'll try to follow up with uh, as many more as we can and then keep us posted if you think of anything else. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. All right.